Sometimes on a Sunday morning we uh, take a couple of verses and really kind of dive into them and take them apart phrase by phrase and maybe word by word to zero in on some specifics. Uh, today I want to do things a little differently and just kind of look at this from 30,000 feet, just, just kind of the, the broad context of, of Matthew 6. And uh, a couple of the, the broad principal things that are, that are in here for us. Um, Leanne uh, went on vacation this week and uh, printed the bulletins before I changed my mind on wh what I was going to preach on. So um, the scripture and the title in the uh, bulletin we'll get to sometime. But, uh, but this morning, I want to look at Jesus' invitation to pray in, in, in Matthew 6. But uh, let's pray together for just a moment. Father, I pray that you would speak to us. May we hear your voice. May we be challenged where we need to be. Where, may we be comforted where we need to be. Speak through the scripture and through the preacher and through the music and through one another that we would hear you and worship you and love you and respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So kind of a broad overall, as I said, from a 30,000 mile perspective here, 30,000 feet perspective, uh, looking down at Matthew 6. Uh, one of the things I think it tells us all through this chapter is that we need to pray authentically. We need to pray authentically. And it says that in various ways all through here. In verse 5, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. To tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. And then down to verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Now why does he say this and why does he re-emphasize this? Because we are all in the image management business. We all do things and say things to shape and manage and manipulate what other people think about us. There's a uh, insurance agent received a call from a man who wanted to buy some life insurance and so the man made an appointment and went over to his house and said, we need to ask a few questions to determine what kind of policy we can give you and what the cost would be. Is your father still alive? And the man said, no, my father's gone. The agent said, well, I'm sorry about that, but uh, uh, when, what age did he die at? And, well, he was 43. The agent asked, what did he die of? It was a massive heart attack. How about your mother? Is she still alive? And he said, no, my, my mother's gone. She died at 41. What did she die of? It was, she died of cancer. So the agent says, I'm sorry, I can't insure you. You are too high of a risk that you will not find anybody that will insure you. Um, no use calling anybody else. Uh, you are just too high of a risk for, to, for any life insurance company to cover you. So he went his way and the man thought, well, I still want life insurance and, and the next company won't know about this conversation. So he called a different company and talked to a different agent. And, he made an appointment and came over and said, I need to ask you a few questions. And is your father still alive? And the man said, no, my father's gone. The man said, well, uh, what, what age was he when he died? And the guy said, he was 94. <laughs> and the agent says, what did he die of? Well, it was a mountain climbing accident. <laughs> and how about your mother? Is, is she alive? And he said, no, no, she, she died at 91. And the agent said, what did she die of? Well, uh, giving birth to my youngest sister. <laughs> so, so he's trying to manage the opinion here. He's, he's uh, trying to shape the opinion of this guy for the benefit of the insurance policy. And we do that all the time. We do things on the outside to be honored and respected by people. And Jesus said, don't pray that way. Don't pray to try and manipulate God into thinking you're somebody different. Don't pray to try and affect the other people around you so they will think you're religious. You need to pray authentically, not to shape God's opinion of you. 
I heard about a girl in military training, and some of you have been through military training, or you have uh, kids that have been, and you know a little bit of what that's about. And it's tough, and it's grueling, and it goes on for weeks, and you're in the mud, and, and uh, uh, the first weeks you're not allowed to, to write home or receive mail, but then the later, later weeks you are. And uh, this girl finally had, had, was allowed to write home, and so she wrote to her mom, and uh, uh, there's some guy that she kind of liked out there, and so she writes this back to her mom. I think I really like this guy, but we can't wear makeup out here, so he doesn't know what I really look like. <laughs> you know, we, we say things and do things to shape and manage and manipulate what others think about us to be liked by other people, to be honored by other people, to be respected by other people. And Jesus says in this text, fasting is a good thing, but don't look like Lurch from the Adams family when you do it. You know, praying is a good thing, but don't pray like you're putting on makeup. Don't pray so that others around you will think you're religious. And there's another kind of a broad thing, I think, that's all through this, this chapter here, that we need to pray as family. And Jesus addressed God as Father. Don't pray with God as your boss. Pray with God as your Father. And there's a big difference there. You know, you work for a boss to, to keep your job or, or maybe to get promoted. That's how you live with a boss, but that's not how you live with a father. So we need to pray as family. And don't pray to manage God's opinion of you. Now, a number of us from our church went to a uh, breakthrough prayer workshop a couple of months ago. And they talked about how a church can pray and, and, and the ways a church can pray. And they, they broke it down into three categories that I, that I thought was, was very, uh, very interesting. They said one of the ways that a church prays is what they called a threshold prayer, which is simply lifting your church to the threshold of God. Very generally, very unspecifically. Sometimes it's a prayer, you know, Lord, make us willing to be willing. And Lord, uh, speak to us, use us, bless us. We want to be your people. We're not sure how to do that, where to do that, what you want us to do. Help us to be loving people. May, may the gospel go out. May people respond. Just this, that, that general open prayer, bringing your church to the threshold of God. And then they said there's what they call archer's prayer. And you kind of get a picture right away of what that's talking about. When you believe you know where God is leading. When you have a specific prayer, when, you, when you've got a target, when there's a, a group you think God is leading you to minister to or a particular person who is in need right now of, of God's touch somehow and, and, and of, of, of some love the church can show. You know, it's a specific prayer, the archer's prayer to a specific target. And then the third one they said was prevailing prayer. Prayer that just continues. And occasionally, God calls a church to make prayer its signal ministry. There's a little East German village called Herrenhut. And back in 1727, a small group of Moravians fled persecution in Czechoslovakia and immigrated to, uh, to what was then East Germany. Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf granted them permission to stay on his estate and eventually gave them a chunk of land, which they named Herrenhut, which means the Watch of the Lord. This was a small group, and they had a little church that they formed there. There was only maybe three dozen people in, the, in that whole church. And in 1727, the pastor got the idea that we need to be doing a round-the-clock prayer vigil. We need to take 24 hours to have our church continually be in prayer for our church and for our community and for the needs of the world. 
And there, there was a little resistance. Not, not everybody wanted to take the 3 a.m. shift, you know, and then, you know, how that goes. And, but, but, but finally, they got 24 people that were willing to sign up to pray for those next 24 hours. That prayer would continually go out from that church in an uninterrupted way for 24 full hours. And when they got near the end of that 24 hours, uh, the pastor said, we need to keep going. We need to do this another 24 hours. So there was a little, little pushback at that point again, but, but they got 24 people that were willing to pray for the next 24 hours. And then that went on again for another 24 hours. How long do you think that went on? Little over 100 years of uninterrupted prayer from that little bitty church, which became a little bit bigger church in those next days. That prayer began in 1727. By 1791, 65 years later, 300 missionaries went out from that church all around the world to serve in, in various ways. Historians today still consider that to be the beginning of the modern missionary movement. That little bitty church and those few people Refugees from Czechoslovakia weren't even sure what, about this prayer thing. The most unlikely candidates in the world to launch the world's greatest missionary initiative. But as they began to pray and as they continued praying and as they committed to that prayer, that church prospered, their call to ministry prospered, their missionary endeavors prospered, and mission posts were started all over the world through the ministry of that little town of Heronhut. John Wesley said this, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. And I need to mention that church's influence on John Wesley. In 1738, after John Wesley was uh, returning from the colonies from a very unsuccessful missionary journey there, uh, in crossing the Atlantic, there were some people from that Heron Hood Church on that ship. And a great storm broke out. Everybody was terrified, including John Wesley. The only ones that weren't were those few folks from Heron Hood because they trusted God. They prayerfully rested in God's presence and in his love and in his protection. And John Wesley was so impressed with them that he followed them to Heronhut and spent time with that little Moravian church there in Heronhut. Studied with them, prayed with them, and he wrote this in his journal. God has given me at length the desire of my heart I am with a church whose conversation is in heaven, in whom is the mind of Christ, and who so walk as he walked. As they have all one Lord and one faith, so they are partakers with one spirit, the spirit of meekness and love, which uniformity and continually animates all their conversation. And I think it's important to see that emphasis on unity of that group was so important to Wesley, who was dealing with a fractious Anglican church at that time. Well, we're going to be asking all of you to pray, and not in a 24-hour prayer vigil, but we're going to be asking you all to pray in a, in a, in a different way. The uh, couple of our ushers are going to uh, come forward and pass out a little card to you now. We want each of you to, uh, to take one of these cards. It's, uh, I actually didn't grab one myself. I'm going to grab one. A little fold-out card. It becomes a little tent. You can uh, stand it up on a on a desk or a or a dashboard or a kitchen table or something like that. The address of our church is 
520 Elm Street. So we're asking you to pray at 520. Now some of us didn't realize that 520 actually occurred twice a day, but uh, those of you that are up at 5.20 a.m., uh, we ask that you uh, take this card, and, and you can see in here there's a little prayer for your church in here. Also, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20 is a, is a verse we've uh, put in here. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then there's a prayer for the church here that we ask you to, to pray. And some of you uh, are going to set your alarm watches or, 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 your, or, your, uh, or your iPhones to, to maybe ring at 520 to remind you to pray. This will just be a, a minute to pray. If you're driving home from work at 520 in the, you know, 520 p.m., uh, you know, we don't want you to have to dig this thing out of your pocket. You can just, just have a quick prayer for the church yourself. But if you're reminded to pray at 520 or if you set your alarms to, to get you to pray at 520, just, just, just that moment. And we want our church to continually be doing that. Uh, uh, some of you will in the morning, uh, a lot of you will in the, in the evening. And there's another church that, uh, that began doing this. And I think their address was uh, 629 something. So, so they, um, they have their church pray at 629. AM, that's a little more doable, although by a little bit, um, in, in, as well as in the evening. And uh, they put together a little video uh, showing their church how to pray and how to use this card. Theirs is 629, ours is 520, but I want you to see what, what they're doing, and this is what we're going to try and do here. God's promises. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have designed, so shall it be. And as I have planned, so shall it come to pass. Isaiah 14, 24. Lord God, we desire to know your preferred future for First United Methodist Church. We lift up our church and ask that you make us the instruments of your design. Break through our human limitations. Show us your way. We pray that God will align our church with God's purposes. We pray that God will break through any barriers between where we minister now and God's preferred future for First United Methodist Church. We may be unified with hearts and minds as one body in Christ. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 6. So we want to take this uh, call seriously to have, just to have you pray for your church. Costa Rica mission team is going to stick one of these in their pocket at 520. Wherever you are, we hope you'll have this in your pocket. Grab, grab two or three of them if you want. We made extras. You might want to put one on your kitchen table for, for 520 dinner time. 
put one in your on your dresser for 5:20, putting on makeup time or whatever you're you're doing if you're up. But uh, we want you to be praying. We want God to bless us, to touch us, to guide us. We're praying for a vision of who God wants us to be. So we continue that journey and ask you to join us in that exciting challenge. Right now, would you take your card and, and open it up, that bottom, the bottom of it, the prayer there, it says, Praying God's Promises. I would ask you to join with me as we pray this together. Lord God, we desire to know your preferred future for La Crescent United Methodist Church. We lift up our church and ask that you make us the instruments of your design, break through our human limitations, show us your way. Amen.